The simple question is, why have Tudor Black Bay chronographs suddenly become so popular? About two years ago, I made a video focusing on the steel and gold variant of this watch, which I still think is arguably the best chrono they've made up until now. And since the 2021 release of these facelifted models, you can't find them. ADs don't stock them. You have to get onto a list like with so many other pieces. A few years ago, this was not the case. And this video, I hope to investigate why the sudden shift. As well as discussing the varied history of these watches, you'll be surprised to know that Tudor chronographs are pretty amazing with their designs. And in typical fashion, I also want to offer a redesign, a reinterpretation of these watches that stay truer to the original source material, the 6263 Daytona, all the while trying to interpret and understand the design of the Tudor Black Bay Chrono. Where to begin? The history is a good place to start. The first references we saw introduced in the 1970s, and you don't really need me to tell you that these watches were from that time, the reference 7031 and the 7149. The 7031 used a Velju 7734, and the 7149 used a Velju 234. These are fantastic watches, very true to the time when they were built and inspired. The color combinations were so striking, especially the Monte Carlo and the original gray dial variant. To understand the inspirations and elements that went into these watches, we have to put ourselves into that headspace where the professional case was being used for everything. Tudor, with its bombastic, creative flair, actually influenced Rolex and the development of the Daytona two decades later. By the time we reached the late 80s and 90s, we saw the Daytona finally receive crown guards. And there were just so many things that they did right here. The use of orange as accent colors, it's so good. Metallicized blue accents that covered the most important details on the watch. Very much representing the car dashboard. Of course, we know this is one of the core inspirations that went into most chronographs of the 70s. One of its most recognizable features or elements that still raises eyebrows today is the Cyclops lens at the six o'clock position. The question I have to ask is why don't brands use this today? Why doesn't Tudor still approach their chronographs like this? Not only having a date at the six, but the Cyclops being centered on the crystal makes a lot more sense. Visually, it breaks up the dial, but doesn't get in the way of everything else. The Cyclops get a good and bad rap a lot of the time, but this combination is excellent and I think deserves a lot more attention. These watches paved the way forward, a completely different direction to its big brother, but the results were amazing and you'll be very lucky to find a great example of one of these in its vintage configuration on the market today for a good price. The next generation, the Tudor Prince Oyster Date series reference 9430 and the Prince Oyster Date 79260. Both of these watches, these variations used a Velju 7750. Now next to the more creative and dynamic models of the previous generation, these are a bit more grounded, clearly recognized today by the three register configuration. And if we were to get into the details about the color combinations, we would be here all day. To celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Tudor chronograph in 2010, they gave us the Heritage chronograph, reference 70330N. These watches using the ETA caliber 7892. Of course, it's very clear to see that they were paying tribute to the success of the original models. And all in all, they do a very good job in replicating them. Of course, bumping up the size to 42 millimeters, adding a few other features like a rotating bezel, a very easy way to tell the difference between the modern and the vintage is seeing that there is no Cyclops lens at the six o'clock. But this was Tudor's first step at giving us a revival. Of course, not everyone will subscribe to the 1970s style and it's a watch that feels more supplementary than something that could really fit into a collection or as a daily wearing piece. At this time, the original language that was attached to these sorts of pieces during the early 2010s is that they were made to be fun. Tudor's core identity, I believe, has always been about fun, or at least being a brand next to its older brother, one that is way less serious. By 2017, we saw the breakthrough. The Tudor Black Bay Chronograph, now using an in-house movement, the caliber MT5813. Most of us know that this was done in partnership with Breitling. Tudor got Breitling's chronograph movements, Breitling got Tudor's automatic movements. The strategy worked excellently, and we were now given what we are accustomed to seeing today. And that brings us up to speed pun intended. Getting the two-tone Black Bay chronograph was one such example that was really a standout. But it wasn't until this facelift, four years later, that we really saw the Black Bay chronograph in the limelight. And I do find that amazing. What Tudor manages to do with such a simple execution, the result, a whirlwind of press following suit and another successful watch that belongs to the Black Bay line. So how did they do it? That's the question. Of course, most of us know now how important the Black Bay 58 has been. 
paramount in a way. Could we say that it has become one of the most successful watches of the century? I mean, how amazing is that? A winning formula, fantastic proportions, great presence on the wrist. The color combination works in all situations. And I believe that is the foundation that made the Black Bay chronograph so good. Instead of introducing it with ceramics and titaniums and two tones, very often are so overpriced that people can't afford them. Simplify it, go back to monotone color schemes, add a few highlights, spot colors, and the result is there. Where does the inspiration come from with this watch? Of course, the Big Crown Submariner was the root of what made the Black Bay line what it is. But what has pushed the development of these facelifted Black Bay chronos, it's the Rolex Daytona 6263. We don't need to argue about this point. The 6263 Big Red Daytona is one of the most beautiful watches that Rolex has made. One of the most beautiful chronographs of all time. What a great place to find your inspiration. It's all right there for you. And what Tudor has been able to do so expertly is take these inspirations while also infusing their DNA into the combination. But there are some reservations I have about this watch which I hope to now explore. The big question is its narrative. What is the story behind it? What is this watch trying to be? Of course, we could say it's a chronograph, but with the Black Bay name attached to it, it's immediately got dive watch affiliations. Is it then a dive watch, a chronograph, or a diving chronograph? I have no idea. Let's try weigh everything up. Screw down crowns, screw down pushes. Very true to the oyster case. A tacky meter on the bezel, good stuff. Racing tracker on the dial, fantastic. Buy compacts arrangement, nicely set up. But then for the sake of legibility, we have rounded plots on the dial and a triangle at the 12. And then of course the unmistakable use of a snowflake hour hand on the dial. The orientation of these components more akin to a dive watch. Now you're probably saying, whoa, hold your horses. We're talking about a chronograph here. This is not a dive watch. Look to the first line of text at the base of the dial. Depth rating in red. Why would there need to be a depth rating on a chronograph? My designer brain gets a bit muddled when I look to this piece. As much as it is very competent, it also doesn't know what it is. And it's trying to ride the line of being something that has all the waterproofness that you would want out of a sports watch, but has chronograph capabilities. Yes, I am knocking this design and I can see it from both sides of the fence. First off, and I think this is very important to establish, it's extremely difficult today to make a chronograph that is instantly recognizable. And what Tudor has managed to do with this watch is break the mold in a way. It's instantly recognizable. Seeing the snowflake hand on the dial and the rounded plots, you know what it is. As far as marketing and presentation goes, this watch gets top marks. But how well does it pay tribute to the 6263 Daytona? And could this be improved? So to the reinterpretation of this piece, what I have done is strip it down, make it much simpler. Looking directly at the 6263, I've tried to create a near mirror image while still holding it to the Black Bay line. Removing the rounded plots, I've implemented batons. At the quarters, I've filled that space with a few squares that make it look a bit cleaner. The date at the six o'clock position, I have inverted so it matches the color of the dial. It's a bit more subtle, it's not so much in your face. It also adds a bit more emphasis to the bicompact's arrangement. I've removed the three lines of text on the dial, replaced the depth rating with chronometer in red. And this is where you can get even more creative. Instead of using a tacky meter bezel on the outside, why not use a dive bezel? Fully graduated, so it gives you more of an impression that it is a racing watch. And then bringing the idea home, removing the snowflake hand, and giving the watch obelisk styled hands instead. I'll be the first to tell you that I don't think this is a perfect execution or a perfect evolution of this watch. I think it's good, but there is an issue to it. The issue with chronograph design today is it's very easy to make something generic looking. And unfortunately, as good as this watch is, it still looks pretty generic. Yes, it does everything well. The proportions look good, but it still looks safe. It was a fun exercise though. You have to test the boundaries. So to return back to that first question of why has the Tudor Black Bear chronograph become so popular? I think it's the result of a perfect storm. What I do admire is that it's a part of the Black Bay line that doesn't look like your typical Black Bay 58. It doesn't look like your typical dive watch. It can be implemented into a collection so well because it offers you an automatic chronograph movement. That's already a huge bonus. It gives you a date complication. It's a watch that's fully waterproof. It has excellent loom. It's also fitted on a bracelet and it also doesn't hurt that this is a great substitute for the reference 116500 Daytona that nobody can get their hands on. The surge in popularity for these pieces, I have no idea if it's going to last. It could very much be new watch syndrome at the moment, and over the next five years, the prices will go down. Chances of you being able to get your hands on them will go up, but it's pretty admirable to see how successful this watch has been. 
how through a simple adjustment, use of monotone colors, a basic formula adopting less is more gives you such a good result. Feels good to finally have a professional setup. Three months ago, none of this was there. I was a disembodied voice. Now I have a face, now I have a professional lighting setup, professional camera, audio equipment, and it feels great. It feels really nice. It feels more at home, but easier. Let's get to the chronograph. Uh, once again, the, the reason why this video came up was because over December, I stumbled on the listings for these pieces and I had no idea that they were going for double retail. And all of a sudden seeing that there's lots of attention on these pieces. They were only brought out last year, but still. Two years back, I made a video and there was no, no interest in the Tudor chronograph. All of a sudden, they change the color, they give it, offer it at a more affordable price, and people go mad for them. So it's a good exercise in business, I guess. Perfect storm, once again, they get the combination right. Uh, not only simplifying it down, introducing monotone colors, but giving you a watch that is extremely versatile at the same time. An automatic, fully waterproof chronograph with a full bracelet is hard to find today. Um, and Tudor seems to get so much attention on them because of what they've managed to do with the Black Bay line. I really wish that this watch was offered under a different line, and that maybe was something I left out in the presentation. I would love to see this chronograph series be its own thing, you know, but the Black Bay name now has such a strong pull factor. It's very difficult to move away from it. Who knows? You might see something better in the future, but that's about it. That's all I have to say. Um, celebrating with a Shiraz, the, uh, the glowing success of the, the new lighting setup. I'll see myself out.